Hello, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, we are Medehaven Vinka Kirk, myself, and this is Luisa Prado, who had the honor of joining us. Luisa wrote an amazing essay called Tender Disasters for the program booklet for the new Infinity, which we really recommend to read. Uh, and we thought that it would be fun to, to create, to set up this uh, evening more as an exchange between our practices than as the classical, let's say, artist interview uh, format. Uh, recognized while Louisa was working on the piece that she's woven quite a lot of her own research into it, which is sort of the same way that we work in that respect. So we're talking about practices that are both very much in between making, thinking, writing, researching, uh, practices that are both very visual, but that also have a, a great deal of thinking behind them, at least that's the case for Louisa's practice. I don't dare to say that for ours, but it's the case for yours. Um, so we've set it up in, in a way that both will introduce and then go deeper into a segment of each practice, and then we'll get to points of exchange uh, and points where there is intersections between, between the, the worlds, hopefully. Right, so Louisa. Thank you. Thank you, Meta Haven. And thank you, Adrian and everyone at Berliner Festspiele for hosting. And so it's interesting to, that we started talking about this concept of tender disasters. What does that mean? Um, we were just here before starting now uh, talking a bit. How do you introduce a talk like this? And uh, in, in my mind, at least, and you know, this, this talk is very much set up as a conversation, so please feel free to intervene. But uh, in my mind, when, when I'm thinking about tender disasters and what I was thinking in terms of like watching your film and, and trying to have to write, not exactly about it, but nearby somehow, uh, also as a reference to Trim Ninh Ha, uh, the amazing feminist filmmaker and theorist who offers this concept of speaking nearby. Um, but I was thinking about tender disasters as these nodes, these points where ancestors and successors become connected, these points, these nodes, where these points of tension really in, in the world where um, where timelines become interwoven, where um, all of these uh, pasts and presents are, are, inter are meshed into each other. Um, to me, it's interesting to think about how these, these disasters, how we survive through these disasters, how they send these shock waves and, and that send us, I would say, in these errant trajectories uh, throughout the world and how we, we survive that moment and that, that, um, yeah, that beginning of this errantry. I feel that through these, these tender disasters, there is this moment of, of spreading around, like seeds across the world. Uh, roots penetrating the soil, our eyes turning towards the sky. And that's kind of what I was thinking of when I first started toying with this concept. Uh, can you, yeah. Yeah, this is perhaps kind of a, a way of, of dealing with that. This is part of uh, a work that I'll discuss a bit more uh, later. It is perhaps a, a very good beginning to this talk. Uh, these were all images produced by a Dutch painter during the Dutch occupation of, of uh, northern Brazil. His name was um, Albert Eckhout. And through this, and now I'm getting a little bit more into my practice. Um, so through these images, they had such a, an influence in how 
Brazilian peoples looked like and, and were like in the European imaginary. Uh, in my practice, I, I work a lot with the, the repercussions of colonialism, and specifically, I look into how um, the, the control of reproduction was and continues to be a fundamental, uh, a fundamental piece in upholding colonial power, but also how there is there are so many forms of resistance within that, so many forms of uh, precisely uh, troubling or dismantling colonial power also through, uh, through technologies related to, to reproduction. So Eckhout, in a way, he created this notion or this hierarchy of bodies. Uh, through his paintings, paintings that are often considered ethnographical paintings, that is, that they um, represent precisely what these people look like, which is, you know, bullshit. But, <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, this is one part of starting to, to think about these things. And I think we can go to the next one, yeah. So in the past years in my practice, I've been you know, dealing with all these connections. And this, this GIF is a very direct reference to something that uh, theorist Paul Preciado talks about. Um, he compares the birth control pill uh, to a form of panopticon. So like a, a self-surveillance device. Um, and uh, in doing that, I mean, when you look at the pill, of course, you know, there is the calendar, there is all of that. So you, when you're using the birth control pill, there is this uh, acute awareness of uh, when and how you're taking that thing, which is necessary for the, the medication to work at all. Like you need to take it with a certain regularity. But there's also so much more to the history of the pill uh, from, for instance, and especially when we're talking about uh, colonial power and uh, also gendered forms of uh, oppression. Um, as it was being developed, for instance, in the 50s, this kind of medication could not be tested in the United States. So what the researchers did with by the way, support, full support of Margaret Sanger, the very famous uh, feminist activist from the US, and Catherine McCormick, uh, a Harris and a suffragist. They outsourced the testing to Puerto Rico, which to this day is a US colony. There was this perception that Puerto Rico was, and I would say even like continues to be, um, uh, a place where there was hunger and poverty and all of that because there were just too many people in the island. Uh, which to me again is a, a, a deviation of the, the true, uh, you know, it's, it's a way of kind of, um, I would say, deviating from the conversation, the true conversation that is Puerto Rico is a colony, so it's been exploited as such and depleted as such and continues to be, I mean, with what happened last year. Um, so the, the birth control pill, before it became the symbol of the sexual revolution in the West, it was tested on bodies who were in, uh, at the margins of, of society, people who were living in prisons, in mental hospitals, uh, people who were living in slums. So there is this, uh, this very painful history also to, to something like the pill. And I'm not saying that it's not important, it's something that I, I try to, to highlight also, but there is a, a colonial history that is fundamentally tied to, um, to this. And the repercussions of that are seen to this day. Um, when the pill was being tested there, 
people actually complained about things like depression or uh, like blood clots. These kinds of things were there, but the researchers thought, and this is a quote, that the complaints were the result of the emotional hyperactivity of Puerto Rican women, also known as hysterical. So, yeah, if you have problems with the pill, thank them and colonialism. So, yeah. And these are uh, videos you made, or what are we... Um, could you speak a little bit about what we're looking at? Yeah, so uh, the previous one and this one, those are GIFs that are part of this work that I'm going to show you in a bit, uh, called All Directions at Once. It's actually a web-based project, so you can see it, you can access it. And uh, in it, I was kind of trying to tie all these uh, nodes, all of these different histories and of birth control, not only in terms of um, of these like really painful stories, but also in terms of how do do uh, how do we survive that? How do we resist that? How do we continue to to uh, to care for each other uh, in face? of these, these violences. So, yeah. Right, so um, from uh, the panopticon, one panopticon to the other, <laughs> um, our latest work, Electra, uh, we wanted to approach this uh, evening very much not as something too pro pro project-based, but much more something practice-based. The idea is practice, not projects. The idea is that what matters are the longer trajectories uh, uh, within, everybody's, within everybody's practice. So the, this film was uncharacteristically for us shot in, in Amsterdam, um, both in studio and in some outdoor locations. Um, and obviously it was a quite difficult piece to realize, not in the least for the technical part, and why? And why? Uh, there is a notion of uh, infinity that's, that's embraced by the project as a whole that you uh, notice that you didn't think about quite on the terms of a dome when you, when you, ent when you, when you get to it. And there is an incredible need in a way in a, for, for, for artistic practices to, to be able to sort of sketch or make mistakes. And, and quickly you start to feel that this is a work for a very, very big stage and that in a way you get your one shot, you get a, like one shot at that, uh, <clears throat> which is difficult to make if you're not particularly um, good at taking penalties. So that's what, what, what happens when you develop a piece like that. You, you, you go out of, you go to post-production, we went to post-production very soon, which means that uh, the piece, you want, sometimes you want pieces to stay fluid for a much longer period of time. And that's something that Dome Works could benefit from, I think. So this is the first time we're talking also about the work. Yeah, yeah, true, yeah. So yeah. forgive so the trauma any is fresh. Kind of, like search for words and trying yeah. to articulate. Um, but um, I wanted to quickly add something because you kind of went immediately into very uh, technical things like post-production. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I wanted to add that like when we were invited to do um, this, to make this work, um, for which I also would like to take the opportunity to thank a few people very quickly, uh, Berliner Festspiele, uh, uh, Thomas Obrender and the team, Adrian, Lisa uh, and Catherine, um, and also the um, technical crew um, that we were able to work with, Frank, Jake, Jacob, Rolf and Johannes and the Planetarium Hamburg, uh, as well as our own crew at Medehaven, um, uh, Barbara and Roman, and um, our crew for the um, film, and uh, Carolis Coverdale who did the music for um, Electra. Um, and um, I quickly wanted to add something about, about this space, because if, you know, Plan uh, planetaria or dome environments are very, um, for me at least, I always associated them with kind of infotainment, um, like places for, you know, where you go to, to and learn about the, the stars. Um, but something that um, 
I think you and I, Danielle, we kind of discovered in the in the process uh, quite late was the like the psychology of the of the dome. Um, there's something very like uh, very practically and technically challenging about uh, pr uh, making a work for a dome that surrounds you fully and that you you. You know, there's no horizon um, like in regular film. There's more of a kind of vantage point um, and an atmosphere that you create. Um, and we kind of found out quite quickly what also doesn't work. So things like humor, we found very difficult um, to refer to things outside of this um, this bubble that you like create yourself. But also the um, like this what the space does on a like psychological level and um, to be honest I don't really have the words yet to describe it but I think that is um, in talking about Im immersion that is I think something that is underestimated a lot with um, um, with dome environments that um, you enter and you immediately are in an environment psychologically that you cannot leave um, do you want to add something well, to Well, I was just thinking of a dome-sized GIF. Yeah. <laughs> what that would look like. <laughs> what would happen to the resolution of a GIF if you put it in an 8K dome? Probably quite interesting, at 60, at 60 FPS. Yeah. So are we talking, yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. I just want to have said that. Yeah, them. no, but yeah. totally, yeah. So, so I think that in our work, you know, instead of perhaps the, the notion of the panopticon, we're very interested in the notion of layering and the notion of multiple claims to the same truth that could be laid. Uh, I think when you, when you do research-based work in whatever that means, you're always talking about the vantage point of the research, and of course it's impossible to get rid of that vantage point. You know, you will, the traces of where you come from, where you stand geographically, economically, uh, in terms of like, identity will always be like there. So even the, the way that these globes are stacked into this kind of like flat earth um, catalog <laughs> uh, is, uh, is bearing traces of weather graphics that come from a certain you know, Western perspective perhaps, even though Africa is the largest continent on this, on this, on this map for sure. Uh, and flat earth is not coincidental. Like we, we live, we, we're interested in examining uh, universes where people create their own truths uh, and where the, the ways in which these truths are perhaps overlapping or laying claim to the same things are creating forms of conflict. And we started out, and this is just a really quick tour through before we move again over to Louisa, just uh, through our film practice, we started making music videos. That's where we come from, music videos with Holly Herndon, more precisely, uh, in which also this, the, the kind of, the, 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 image, the, the way of how do you make like geopolitics of the cloud legible? How do they make themselves legible? And that's largely done through uh, PowerPoint graphics. So these are the NSA logos that are over, that are sort of raining down. Uh, this is obviously a stage before the stage, or a few stages before where we are now. This is like from where we're the, the Snowden revelations were 2013. That seems like a century ago right now, literally. So this, these are really interesting forms of compression of time happening as we, as we practice and, and, and speak and do what we do. You know, we, we, we can't look back in any sort of orderly way to, to whatever we did before. So, so uh, we start to embrace, in other music videos for Holly, we start to embrace a more scenographic approach, quote-unquote, consisting of water bottles and candles, mostly, uh, and, and locations in, 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 in Amsterdam. Uh, and we, this is actually Digital Tarkovsky, a book that we wrote uh, last year, but the, the Tarkovskian tropes are already in this music video. That was the idea, at least. So a lot of what we do is made for installation, so we try to democratize our work now a little bit more by having it being screened in educational contexts, etc. as well. But it is really built for installation and, and we're really interested in a way that aesthetics can play a act, more active role or different aesthetics can play a very, like an active role in mu moving image work. 
These are images from Information Skies, film from 2016 that was nominated for the European Film Awards uh, Department of Short Film. Um, and did, and did not win. And did very much not win. <laughs> Eurasia, questions on happiness. Um, a keyboard in like slag. So this is the environment that we're interested in and what writing means in those, this environment. This is an installation of Eurasia, Questions on Happiness, featuring a rug. So textile and film are related for us in a way. Um, and, and like when, 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 I, when, I, when we listen to Louisa, like what strikes me is that your practice is very precise about the, the elements of history that it takes uh, to critique. It's very precise about the vantage point from where that comes. And it's in that sense very detailed and at the same time very wholesome. And, and it feels sometimes the way that we work is more like we're like on a beach and we're like finding things on a beach or something. And sometimes the order in which we find things on the beach determines the way in which they end up in the, in the work. Um, so there's a, there's a methodological nuance there for sure, I think. Um, so, so a lot of the work we do is quite, quite sort of like visually busy, um, and it's also using multiple formats such as like film, but also you know YouTube channels and 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 overlays over YouTube channels that you can create your like own stories with again. So the notion of the overlay is both about is not so much a kind of postmodern need to like create like confusing layers, but it's really to do with multiple truth claims that are overlapping the same material. Mm. So the, the, yeah, yeah. So this is from the sprawl propaganda about propaganda, uh, where we're trying to sort of unsee propaganda. Mm. And this is from 2015, which is not a century ago, but like about half a century ago. Uh, and we will maybe get to that. To what extent can you still make work that is actually tracing things that are happening in the world? And to what extent will you always run behind things to some extent? So what is the moment that you need to hand over your mic literally to your own kind of subconscious and say like, what, what do you feel is gonna happen? And don't, what, 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 what is not the thing that happened? What is the thing that's gonna happen? Um, at that point, it's a good moment now to hand over to you, unless you want to add to this, Vinka? No. no. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to see this kind of difference in, in methodology, definitely, but because I, I work with this very specific subject, but at the same time, especially like maybe like in this GIF work, that, that keeps on appearing here. It's what I kind of wanted to do also is to explore something in a bit of a disconnected way. So there's all these bits and pieces that work together, but they also, they're also like their own little stories, their own independent things. Um, maybe, yeah, maybe we can go further. Yeah, just like some some parts of what I've been doing, like some images um, uh, of what I've been doing. This is part of a, a film that I'm gonna talk about in a second. Maybe we can go, yeah. So I think it's also important to give a bit of a, a context of, for like why I'm doing what I'm doing, why am I so interested in that um, for those who are not familiar with her, she's uh, Marielle Franco. She was a politician in Rio who was assassinated last year. Her uh, murderers are connected to the Bolsonaro family, which is currently, uh, unfortunately, governing or disgoverning, I don't know what the hell is that, Brazil. And um, she, uh, yeah, she was one of the very, very few out politicians with a lot of visibility in, in the country. And her killing to me marked 
a moment uh, after the coup that we had in 2016, where, at least in, 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 my, in my feeling, I felt, okay, this is getting really, really bad. Like, if this happened to her, to me that was a message to everyone who uh, is working, uh, yeah, to all activists, to everyone who is politically engaged. And, um, I mean, she had just left an activist meeting when she was murdered. And coincidentally, uh, when her murder happened is also when I is exactly on the day that I was writing about this project that I've been uh, working on called like a, a topography of excesses is kind of the general umbrella of all of these different works that um, I'm gonna talk about. And it's exactly when I was conceiving this that this happened. And to me also that speaks a lot about this, uh, this brutal colonial structure that decides who gets to live and who gets to die, who gets to have children and who doesn't. So, yeah. Yeah, we can go a little bit further. So talking about uh, Bolsonaro and the connection to these like larger historical structures and how they kind of unfold towards past, presents, and futures. Um, this is a, a two-channel video installation that I, I did this year where I'm kind of connecting that research on, on the imagery of, uh, of Brazil, Brazilian peoples and this creation of this racial hierarchy within the country to what Bolsonaro has been saying about population control since he became an, an elected politician in the 90s. His discourse has been consistent over decades and decades um, in terms of defending the sterilization of uh, poor people and by extension, because he's a master of dog whistles of people of color in Brazil. Um, and this is fundamentally tied to, to uh, this creation through colonialism of, of these hierarchies uh, that determine, uh, yeah, which lives are, are uh, valuable and which are not, which bodies can be exploited and which cannot. So, yeah, it, I think this is a very depressing work, actually. Uh, because the kinds of things that, that you have there, you know, of course, the, what he says is very obviously violent, the quotes, but it's not only that. I mean, there's an image of breasts that keeps appearing. That comes from a treatise that where European scientists try, try to determine breast shape in relation to race. So, yeah, that's kind of the, the, the background for that. I think we can go further. Um, this work, I mean, it also deals with uh, similarly difficult issues, but I feel that it's, it's more hopeful. Um, in this work, I mean, this is a, a still from a film, and yes, it is Google Maps because I did not have funding to go to Brazil to film it. Um, so in this work, I kind of explore I've been working with plants a lot, you know, when you look at things like the birth control pill, it's very interesting, but also it's extremely depressing, and after some time you need something that lifts you up, because otherwise it's, it's just too hard. And I've been looking a lot into the use of plants for, uh, for birth control and abortion, or for also, uh, on the other hand, for fertility. And um, one of the plants, actually the plant that really got me into this, into this whole journey, is a plant called the peacock flower. Um, one of the, I would say one of the, the f perhaps the first, I think, uh, documentation of this plant uh, is from the 1700s. And it's from this woman, uh, Maria Sibylla Marian, who went to Suriname. She was Dutch German and she, she went there as a scientist and an artist. She was one of the first European women to do that. 
And uh, she's very celebrated, actually, because of that. And uh, she documented the use of this plant by indigenous and African peoples in Suriname, in the Americas, as a way of practicing abortions, which uh, was a form of resistance against uh, the, yeah, their exploitation in the, the, um, the colonial economy at the time. And uh, it is a very heartbreaking story. Um, and also, it's interesting to see how Marion is so celebrated. Also because of this, she was one of the few people to actually talk to, to those who were using the plant and, and listen to what they, they were saying. But also, I have to always, I like to always remind people that she learned that because she herself had slaves. So there is this, uh, also this side to the story. But anyway, I, I got very fascinated by this plant because precisely because of such a weirdly complicated history. And uh, it took me a while to realize that actually this plant is super common in Brazil. In Rio, where I'm from, it grows, in, I'm from Tijuca, a neighborhood in the northern part of Rio, and it grows everywhere because, and then I found out, it's actually, it's actually recommended as official policy that this plant is used for urban decoration, for like urban afforestation. I mean, of course, in, in Brazil, abortion is uh, very um, stigmatized and illegal. And of course, you know, there's not, people don't know about this. But to me, it was so interesting to see this plant growing all over the place. It's recommended for that because the roots of this plant go straight into the earth and they don't ruin the pavement around it. And it's also a very beautiful plant. It flowers in a couple of times a year. Uh, now in August, it, now it's like end of flowering season, and it flowers in these, like, it grows these bunches of flowers, red and yellow, such a bright color, and it almost looks like the whole tree is on fire. It's beautiful, beautiful. And, and it's there, and it's this, uh, I think we can pass. It's almost this, this yeah, this, tender form of resistance, I would say. And it also, like in this movie, I explore how this tree grows around the neighborhood, and particularly in front of a military police battalion that exists in, in uh, my neighborhood, where during the dictatorship that lasted in Brazil until 1985, um, in that specific place, there were the most disappearances and killings um, and during, like, of all the places, all, all, of all the, the uh, yeah, the battalions during the dictatorship. So, to me, that plant growing there, right in front of those walls, is uh, a very beautiful and hopeful sight, I would say. Yeah. And now we get to the gifts. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, this is the web-based project I was talking about before. Um, in it, I kind of mash up, you know, there's the, the, the peacock flower is also present, but there's like a whole mashup of different things and different references. There's the, the, the panopticon over there in the, in the corner. Uh, there's other plants that have... Uh, uses as uh, birth control or as abortifacients, like rue, for instance, which is this like longish, yeah, it's gone now, but <laughs> uh, yeah, these longish leaves, the bright green leaves, that's rue, which is also a super uh, spiritually important plant in Latin America. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't like to explain a lot every image because I, I don't think that's the point. It's really this kind of this confusion. But basically in this work, I wanted to explore the idea of like experimenting with the essay format, but through GIFs. Because then it, to me, it's, it gives you all kinds of different possibilities for the text. How do you work with text in that context? 
that's a terrible sentence actually, text in that context. But um, how do you work with text uh, in motion? How do you work with text uh, when you have also this chaos of images and, and like issues with, with uh, speed and, 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 uh, and uh, legibility and all of that? So, yeah, in this work, I try to connect all of these different points. Kind of, that's more kind of a picking up stuff at the beach kind of situation than, than other works. And, uh, yeah, if you want to access it, you can find it. Um, it's hosted at the Schloss Solitude uh, domain because I, I did it as part of the, a web residency for Schloss Solitude. So it's, uh, and it's called All Directions at Once. So now I think... Like what, what yeah. I what what I uh, like a lot about it is the the difference in oh it's just like oh wait uh, is the fact that the, the the text points at a different pace than the images so the text mm -hmm. goes in a way is very attentive and slow and the images are just popping and it's very it's a nice combination or sort of voiceover in a way mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah because there's just I was thinking about, when I was uh, uh, coming up with this project, I was thinking about these different temporalities that kind of coexist and, and go like, towards all directions at once and explode in a way. Uh, so as you're, you're navigating, uh, I, and I also work with, it's, it's interesting because I, want to, I wanted to work with stillness too. So in, this of course is a capture, but in the web-based project, you have to keep your mouse still in order for things to appear. If you move, then it goes away, and then you lose it. So there's this demand of attention also, and of, even though you know, the attention span for something like this is so difficult. Yeah. And uh, this uh, is a, a photo from a performance dinner that I did at Savvy Contemporary uh, earlier this year in January. So a lot of the plants that I've been looking at, that I've been researching, at some point I realized that they are also foods. So um, the peacock flower actually, it has like these kind of pods, kind of almost like, you know, bean pods or pea pods that are eaten in Mexico. And of course, you know, that's, that's something I always try to explain to people. Um, they don't provoke abortions. It's just to, like plants have many, many different parts. So the root will do something, the bark will do something else, the leaves, the, uh, the fruit, the, you know, all of these different parts may have different effects. So the fact that, you know, some parts of these plants or foods don't, doesn't mean that I'm like giving you like an abortion dinner or something. But it's, uh, it's uh, in, in this dinner, I tried to also kind of create this space where we could talk about these things, where we could kind of through the food and through, I mean, food has in itself, like serving, cooking and serving a dinner in itself has such a, a deep significance. And to me, it's also um, such an interesting exploration of um, first, I would say, like different forms of intimacy and also of care. Because a lot of this work that I'm doing, it is about, it is thinking about care. And I've been like, going around with this concept of radical care, like radical forms of care. Um, so in, the, in this dinner, I cooked uh, all of this like Brazilian food that I grew up also eating, but I, I used as main ingredients for each dish, um, yeah, plants that are uh, used for birth control or abortion. And yeah, I had like, I smoked things with mugwort. And I mean, that, that makes it look very witchy, especially this picture is so witchy, I love it. 
Um, and uh, yeah, I smoked things with mugwort. I, I used like all of these different herbs and, and, and even things like coconut milk or, or plantains, you know, because they're also part of a family of plants or they're used, you know, some parts of the plant are used in a certain place for this. So yeah, and that was very interesting. And these dinners um, are usually uh, accompanied by uh, a moment of storytelling, like some some kind of performance, which I did in this one, and I'm also doing as part of my current project at Akud on the 20th. I'm doing another dinner. I'm excited. Yeah. Is everyone invited? Yeah, <laughs> of course. I love how you talk about the plant as almost this object of contradictions yeah. where the root you know can be extremely violent and the another part can be nurturing yeah um, yeah yeah beautiful yeah what are both at the same time even yeah 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 like uh, what what is interesting about this image i think in in terms of like the relationship is that that it's like you you talk about the cooking session as a set setting for storytelling meaning that there is a, an incredibly expanded way in which we can think about cinema as well. Cinematic experiences are not confined to like screens or, or even domes or even like our phones, but they can be created in, in you know, like all kinds of circumstances. Uh, immersive, immersive situations can be created uh, with also by, by cooking, for example. I think there's a neat parallel between cooking and, and filmmaking in a way, like you're, you're this is in the production. So now we're going to show like a few uh, production stills for, or like film stills from stills from like the production of Electra. This is uh, the, the yeah. What some is this? Some pebbles from the beach. It pebbled yeah. some pebbles from the beach or whatever. So, um, uh, so this is this the, the 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 kind of like fish eye lens. So you're always filming upwards, and this is in some um, dome like play dome in Amsterdam, which are part of a kind of social democratic sort of history of how to deal with public space in a way. Anyway, this has a, stra a strange relation with the image you showed before uh, in the forest. This is a net that we created in, in, in the forest, which is not a very big forest. Um, images from the shoot. So there's, there's, this is really speaks to the idea of vantage point and the idea of how you create what you see and what you don't see, basically. Of course, film is incredibly manipulative. Um, and even when you ex expose the manipulation, even that is a manipulation. So it's, it's, it's a very manipulative, manipulative thing, but you don't need to use it to manipulate people. You can, you can create these images to do the opposite of, of manipulating people. Um, this is why, why we're showing this one is particularly because this camera brand is called Red. And they have this very weird sort of new metal aesthetic on the, on the cameras that makes you feel that it's sort of strongly identified with <clears throat> a kind of like characters from the, the Big Lebowski or something. There is something about this logic of this skull and Red and the names that these cameras have that just makes it kind of weaponized in a very weird way. Well, it was called the Red Monstro. Yeah, this one's called Monstro, but they also have a camera called Weapon, for example. And with the reason that we worked with this camera was because it was the only one that could, could go to the full 8K, otherwise the, our, our camera person, Remco, was very opposed to working with Red because he wants to work with only a certain type of camera that's actually German. Uh, called Ari Alexa, but so they wanted, then now we had to work with the red, but then it, it, it struck us that there is a kind of weaponization of, of, of image resolution and a weaponization of the camera going on at the same time. Building these nets, these are Roman and Barbara, uh, Remco and Vinca, and the Stolen Sun, so it has a relationship with a certain poem called The Stolen Sun. Um, studio set up. So we never kind of show these sort of like production images or anything. This is a production image from Hometown, a, a film we shot in Beirut and Kiev in 2017. And maybe that's our case study, uh, like, the, like, or m not so much the case study, but it's a project to 
maybe, well, I don't know if we will zoom into it, but it's when we talk about tender disasters, this is probably one of our tender disasters. Please explain. Well, because the, 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 the thing that you said about radical care uh, is something that uh, we, um, that, that also translates to, to notions of belonging. So there is not just the care, like in another image in this presentation that we do, didn't use, but I will show, I will pop it up to explain it. Sorry. I'll hold your mic. No, no, it's fine. Like, <laughs> oh God. I don't know, wh where is that image? Okay, well, I can say it says like, uh, it talked about Latvia's nomadic startup genius. And the idea is that the genius who is the contemporary central, central figure to today's economy is a kind of weightless figure who is always traveling and who has no, no roots in a way, has, no, bound, has no, no boundaries in a way, becomes someone who's kind of always on the move and kind of entirely nomadic. And the notion of belonging, in whatever way you explain or talk about belonging or even the notion of radical care, gets completely lost in that, in that, that, that persona in a way. And in, in, in hometown, we, we constructed a, a kind of a non-existing hometown that merged out of these two cities, Ki cities, Kiev and Beirut. So the film is also bilingual. So the notion of home or the notion of belonging cannot be resolved by referring to a single place or a single identity or a single language or a single like uh, a form of um, uh, situatedness. It's something that bears its contradictions in it. Um, and in a sense, when we started to work on Electra, because the film talks about the child's perspective strongly as well, we, 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 we build Electra, or certain starting points for Electra, we, we were strongly built, I guess, from hometown, even though these are completely different works, um, intersected by animations as well. So the, the way in which the immersive experience is built is, is quite, it's quite composed. It's quite something that, that involves different visual worlds that come together, actually, sort of two visual worlds. And central to the story of hometown is a caterpillar who gets murdered. And the, the, so this is something that is at the same time incredibly insignificant and super significant because, because of your building an immersive world, the the caterpillar can become a kind of totality. It become, can become like a sort of trauma of the film and both protagonists are evading responsibility for this crime in a way. So it talks very strongly about the rise of something like morality or conscience in terms of uh, our, the way that we look at, look at things. But it's also lyrical and that's the other thing that, that is important to talk about, the notion of lyricality. No, the notion that enthusiasm and warmth can be as strong forces and voices of critique as much as critique itself. So uh, there is a way that criticism can be voiced through um, lyricality. It also has pink subtitles, which, which uh, like side note. <laughs> yeah. So a while ago, when you had your Vimeo upload, it would, and if something would go wrong, it, it would say something is weird in the magical forest. So there is a way in which uh, the kind of world of magic and, and everything that's connected to it can never be completely, is, is so central to how we deal with technology and how we deal with platforms, etc. cetera. Um, and for, for us, for Metahaven, uh, poetry uh, and poetic practices have been incredibly important in like shaping the way that we look at script, for example, and shaping the way that we look at narrative. Um, these are some of our influences. This is actually a tablecloth, so that's not a poet exactly, but there is uh, a, the, the late writer Svetlana Boim used um, the notion of a table, the red tablecloth as a visual cue in a poem that she cites from um, uh, Giorgio Caproni, uh, and he says that I have returned there where I had never been. Nothing has changed from how it was not. On the table, on the checkered tablecloth, half full, I found again the glass never filled. 
all has remained just as I had never left it. This, this was a quite important uh, starting point for hometown. And then, um, like Svetlana Boyne describes this moment that she has never actually owned a tablecloth like that, but that she immediately remembers it, although she never had one. And that's an interesting thing that sort of visuals can do. You can like evoke these sort of sensations, even if there's no sort of common, there's no, there's no, there's no there was never really a tablecloth. So it's just a, a way of evoking these kind of strong mental concepts in a way. And here further on, she says something that strongly applies to the, the current world. It projected an anti-Western message in the global language of Western popular culture that struck back at the West like a boomerang. The ability to speak the global language and use the web is no guarantee of a shared culture, democratization, or mutual understanding. You want to say something about these? Or? Okay. Yeah, okay. Well, this is uh, actually um, next week we're opening a show in New York at Eflux uh, called Turnarounds. And the Turnaround poems is a genre of children poems that are made up on the go in Russia, so they don't have authors. Uh, and in every sentence, the same sentence or the same, that the, the, the meaning of the sentence is denied. So in a way, in a sense, there's in dry weather with knee-high puddles on a brick, brick street made of wooden planks, walked a tall man of short height, curly with no hair, thin like a barrel. There is a way of meaning or the, what we suppose is constitutive language leading to meaning is being hijacked in these poems. Um, and we're trying to get after the the way wh where what these poems are in a literary sense, but also what they are in a cultural sense. Uh, this research or this interest in poetry has also brought us in contact with the poet Eugene Ostashevsky, who is one of the main translators, actually the main translator of um, Russian quote unquote absurdist poetry into English. Uh, someone born in Leningrad now lives in New York and Berlin. Uh, he just won a major prize, why, by which he's going to be more in Berlin, I think. But he, he released this incredible poetry collection, The Pirate Who Does Not Know the Value of Pi. Uh, and it, it is a story about a pirate and a parrot. And in the, the way in which we use language um, in a kind of very imprecise way, uh, particularly using metonym, metaphor, and allegory, which are very strong figures in what is now called post-truth. Post-truth is a game with those language forms, largely. Uh, but the work of a, a whole range of poets, Alexander Videnski, Daniel Harms, and his, their contemporary sort of successor, Eugene Ostashevsky, but there's also other ones, uh, is a critique of that type of language. Fundamentally, so it's a, it's a form of poetry that fundamentally matters to where we are politically right now. And just to end with, before we open up and start to just make a mess, um, this is a really short passage from, from the, the pirate. This island is deserted, said the pirate. No, it's not, said the parrot. Do you know something I don't, said the pirate. It can't be deserted if we're on it, said the parrot. So that's very much I bring together the notion of maybe radical care with, uh, with poetry, I guess. Um, yeah. <laughs> so like after this, there are no more slides. I think there's just this one. Yeah. <laughs> there were more. Yeah, there we were more, them. but like we have to, at some point yeah. we have to stop. So we can just immerse ourselves now in some tender disasters. Um, and maybe we can add a little bit about the way that we wrote the script for Electra. Um, Electra was the film that um, came, that we feel is kind of the successor of Hometown. Uh, and the script for Hometown is based, uh, it's like our own kind of version uh, or inter yeah, kind of a play with these um, forms of children uh, poetry, these turnarounds. And um, yeah, this has also been a kind of huge influence for the scripts uh, for Electra, where we also talk, you know, use this contradiction, um, the summer snow, um, repetition. Um, I just wanted to add that. Right. <laughs> okay, should we 
open up for questions and Maybe. comments. Maybe. Yeah. I see a question. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, someone's coming with a mic. Uh, hi. Um, so, yeah, just to start, like, thanks for your work. I think the idea of uh, radical self care is too often ignored uh, when we talk about the sort of multiplicity of ways um, direct action can exist. Um, but uh, I guess I just wanted to ask about uh, the idea of like agency and political agency in your work. Um, so um, I guess what I see is something that connects um, uh, all of you three together is like um, this quite like um, qualitative approach to um, uh, to how you present uh, like the narratives and um, uh, it's often uh, focused on individual moments, individual people. Um, uh, yet there's this like constant uh, retachment uh, to obviously sort of more like macro economic or macro social uh, phenomena such as like colonialism, uh, etc. Um, and um, I guess. Um, yeah, and I guess this is sort of like represented on a more like abstract level when you talk about uh, sort of like multiple like temporal timelines coming together um, or uh, poetry, I guess like all these things sort of like altering our classical notion of subjectivity. Um, but yeah, yeah, uh, sort of insisting, yeah, on this uh, relation to like material conditions and colonialism, etc. So I guess the, the, the question I'm, I'm trying to ask is, um, um, is like where where do you feel your art uh, stands in terms of like political agency in itself? And I, I want to ask this question on two levels. Uh, like, firstly, um, do you feel that your art uh, can be an agent of political change in itself, uh, presented like autonomously? So. Uh, therefore like contextualized by you as an artist, uh, as a woman, as an activist, uh, as an individual. Uh, and firstly, yeah, firstly that, and secondly, uh, its agency uh, as a work of art presented in a project such as Meter Haven with a lot of other artists, a lot of other things happening, and therefore the sort of like meter narrative that can be constructed out of uh, sort of like a community of pieces of art coming together for a specific moment of time that makes sense. Okay, I feel like I need to kind of unpack a few things. Um, first of all, what do you mean when you say like the art by itself? Because I don't know, like I particularly don't see, I mean, the, the art is there in the world. Like I don't see it as operating by itself at all but operating within this, all of this context. And uh, yeah, so I, 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 I need to understand that. Um, I, guess, uh, I guess it's, I guess the easiest way to put it would be sort of like, maybe related to like uh, authorship as in like you like the either the curator or creator of this like uh, piece of art that stands like autonomously and gives its own na narrative autonomously uh, um, in what is presenting uh, without having to be yeah, contextualized uh, within like the frame of a festival or something like this yeah. mm -hmm. autonomously in the sense of like it doesn't need to be explained necessarily or it doesn't need to be like um, n no, 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 Ex uh, explained for sure, um, but uh, um, uh, uh, explained, uh, uh, what would be the easiest way to put it, um, is in like, you, you've put together a set of images and videos, etc. Um, uh, based around a certain topic, 
uh, with a certain narrative and a certain concept and something you're trying to convey. Um, but this, yeah, within something like Meter Haven, uh, can be, I guess, like a smaller part of like a wider meter narrative alongside other pieces of art, if that makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's, yeah, th my question, I guess, was just more about uh, like, yeah, where do you stand like on those two levels in terms of like your art as some, like as an, a real life sort of like material agent of like political consciousness and political change, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you? This is, a, a, I think it's a question to you, no? But uh, yeah. All of you. Um, <laughs> because I'm curious if there's one specific work that you have in mind. I mean, we, um, there is, I think, a difference between the intent uh, which you can make a work, um, the kind of, in, like, the intuitive kind of um, necessity, um, I can feel to make a work. In my case, I also have to, uh, you know, I, um, we then have to kind of, we, we talk about the intent together and whether it's, you know, how that work can be about, uh, can come about. Then there's a process of like the making itself and also the, you know, the audience. And I think the, an audience will always kind of um, view the work um, in their own way and have their own interpretation of it. Um, and um, those are, to some extent, uh, very different processes that are uh, also not, um, don't always kind of end up being what you want them to be. So you can have like an intent or a reason uh, to make a work, um, and then an audience can read something different into it, right? Yeah. Um, I think that's all I really can answer to that. Very long question, but thank you. Um, I think that, that, that in my case, like, uh, there's, there's clearly, I think when, I, when looking at Louisa's work, there's a very, very clear politics to that work, but those are not the politics that are dictated upon political art. When we talk about political art, we talk about a very narrow, like, the, the understanding of what political art is is probably still too narrow. Um, so the, creating political work means creating a politics for one's work, not necessarily fitting in a politics that's given or predetermined by the, by the circumstances or by others. Uh, the way that you look at these eugenic, like the European colonial project, which is of course producing these images and these, these, you know, these, these classification systems that, that Europe, Europeans created to kind of like organize the world sort of according to, to their own image, that, that is a very, very long process of, of undoing and unpacking and critiquing, uh, which problematizes the, uh, Europe, the, the sort of European voice politically, inherently, I feel. Like when, you know, we, had, we have a common friend, Flavia Zodan, and once I made, I texted her something about fra the, the experience of the political landscape fragmenting, which is something that from, a, from the perspective of a sort of white European, you can, you can experience that everything is fragmenting. And Flavia answered in a very long thread, which was uh, that, you know, this fragmentation has been real for uh, people that are not white Europeans for a very much longer time than it was, than, it, than it's real for, let's say, that group. So the politics, like from where you speak, it determines a lot about the politics that you have, that, that, you, that you do. And I think that in my case, I've seen um, political movements that I thought would create like a massive change in our societies for the better actually turn out for the worse. So I've seen how power that gets entrusted in non-transparent ways gets sort of easily misused. So I'm very hesitant to proclaim, here's my politics, here's what I, like, here's the, the thing that's gonna happen. Uh, like, yeah, that's sort of, yeah. So, so indeed, like, it, there's a difference between intent and outcome, but it also depends on vantage point. Yeah, I think that's perfect, actually. Anyone else? So, so ways in which, uh, sorry, you were? Yeah, yeah, I was just going to ask okay. if there was. Sorry, go ahead. Else. No, I was just going to ask if there was anyone else who wanted to say something. 
Hello, hello. Hi. Um, I think this is a little. I got a question about time, and um, maybe it's more to Medhaven. Um, you mentioned uh, Tarkovsky. I know this very sort of slow cinema, and I was wondering how you think about time, especially. Um, I think you've done some longer work at works, and you also said that you prefer to uh, exhibit them as opposed to show them. About maybe how time, how you think about time in terms of uh, exhibiting a film, like a longer work, or how people react to that, or how you think about time in general, I think would be interesting for me to hear. Great question. Um, where to start? Tarkovsky, maybe? <laughs> um, which immediately means your cue. <laughs> so I can have more time to I think. I don't want to talk about Tarkovsky. Okay. Um, <laughs> I think Tarkovsky is a kind of common name for something, for something, right? He's just the most well-known representative, representative of an, a certain approach to time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so we wrote this essay called Digital Tarkovsky where we, you know, we're big fans of Tarkovsky, but also he has this as a, you know, he's a kind of, um, icon of Russian cinema and all the cliches that come with that as a kind of, you know, difficult Russian cinema that's too long and too slow. There's, you know, loads of memes on that, um, how that's like, um, in, you know, stigmatized. But um, we wrote this essay kind of thinking about time uh, that, you know, we used to kind of, um, how the time that we spend kind of watching um, on our phones and on our devices, how that is kind of related to this idea of quote-unquote slow cinema. Um, so it's a, this essay is a kind of an exploration and a kind of provocation in a way to think about Tarkovsky and this idea of slow cinema as almost a provocation to, to think more about where cinema could move to and is it cinema, new forms of cinema or new forms of slow cinema not already here in our lives, you know, the kind of anticipation that we all have when we're waiting for this one text to arrive or this message from this, you know, that's gonna affect how we move through the day or how we, um, you know, this friend to just told us to screenshot a film on a Flix bus through Europe um, and, you know, like that film so much so we end up screenshotting it and then and it ends up being almost like a film itself. Um, so yeah, Tar Tarkovsky really helped us in kind of thinking about time a lot. Um, the way that we, um, for us it was important that this film was, the film for the Dome was going to be a bit of a shorter film. We've done longer films, 70, um, 70 or 60 minutes for you know museum or gallery installations are considered to be very long, too long. Uh, we always hope that it's uh, also a little bit of a choice that you can kind of move in and move out. Um, something that a cinema doesn't allow you to do. Once you're in, you know, you go into this red seat and you recline and you're, and you're stuck there and you can leave afterwards. But we hope that um, with our installations we can, uh, you know, offer maybe a little bit of a kind of choice in that on how long you want to stay. Um, so it's more kind of, I don't think there's a kind of end, end point to this question of, of, of time, how we present our work. It's more that we um, try to figure it out by doing. Yeah, I think like in addition to that, if I may like really briefly, that uh, like when, let's say video, then when television dominated the media landscape, everything had to be implicitly made for television, meaning that a television-related attention span became dominant in, forms of, in, in many forms of moving image. It meant that a music video was actually a compressed feature film, you know, compressed into the duration of a song. It, everything became televisable and everything became fit for television. And now we, we're seeing that the timelines are widely diverging. So the, the patience that is needed to, um, let's say th that we have, we're dealing not just with different for forms of time production, but also with different forms of patience. 
um, w for the for the image, and uh, that we need to start to acknowledge uh, forms of uh, image making that are not seen traditionally as cinema will be have to be seen at some point as being kind of like really cinematic, uh, such as the images that are produced by satellites, the images that are produced by uh, all kinds of forms of machine vision that are not acknowledged within the cinematic spectrum, but nevertheless produce often very slow moving image uh, are, are cinematic regimes. And th those, those are quite interesting because these are sort of non-hegemonic with regard to the cinema discipline. So these are forms of cinematic, uh, cinematic structure that are sort of being, they're not admitted to the, to the official realm of cinema, but that are nevertheless cinematic. And th that in that sense have a great deal in common with art. Um, so that's where, 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 where we can talk about cinema. Uh, as something that is as much in these cooking, like the, the sessions that you describe, they're, they're sort of proto-cinematic in a sense as well, though they're created for a human, for a human um, attention span in a way, but they're not, they're, yeah, the, 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 the eventual medium in which this is to be represented is still to be sort of to be decided. Like interestingly, the new iPhone 11 Pro is like, is equipped as a fully, as a fully equipped cinema camera. So there is, in a way, this notion of the cinematic, of a sort of everyday cinematic is also technologically, in terms of optics and software and the combination between optics and software, hardware and software currently sort of ongoing. Um, this is not an Apple advertisement, by the way. But just, just an acknowledgement of <laughs> where these things stand. Um, you were talking about compression of time earlier already. And how do, does this refer to the iPhone camera in cinematic approach, kind of? Uh, like you said, like the last six years felt like a uh, century. Yeah, like since 2013, it was a century. Um, like for me, one of the seismic moments with regard to the iPhone is the moment that Erdogan uh, was on FaceTime during the coup in Turkey. Uh, and the way that FaceTime operated as a sort of extra mediatic verification mechanism of the reality of the situation. That you had something that Erdogan needs, like is, he's going to bypass the, the, the way in which a coup can take place to sort of like control national television by using FaceTime. Uh, so the idea that, that, that what was referred to was not so much the structure of the national broadcasting situation, but the kind of like stack like one stack, one layer in the stack sort of above yeah, it was, that. he was brought in on a phone. Yeah, exactly. Through but, FaceTime but, but, yeah, on the news. Yeah, so that's true. But, like it, but the, the source was not himself. It was through FaceTime, meaning that it involved the entire sort of st stack of that sort. Um, so in that way, um, mm, I'm not sure if that's actually an answer to your question, but it's sur surely not the iPhone camera itself that did the, did the compression. It's the, the way in which acceleration and compression happen within time in, in the way that we experience it that creates the idea of distanciation in my opinion at least through like through of the past being completely non-linear as in the experience of 2013 feels like it's centuries ago and like uh, maybe already 2015 also um, and I think it, pre it presents a problem for documentary practices like where do you stop like there's this film um, hyper hyper normalization by Adam Curtis, which is built around BBC archives, with which which continues to include Trump. It, like it, at the very end, like Donald Trump is like Donald Trump is brought in, like he's brought in earlier in the film, but it, it tries to just keep up so that it includes as much of the present as possible to be able to deliver a sort of diagnosis. And this is becoming increasingly difficult. It be, it's it's sort of increasingly difficult to stay up to date. Which is maybe why, like unpacking, you know, colonial histories and uh, things like that, is such an is sort of an attract is a, is a relevant alternative to these to the, to to this, because the, the people that created these um, um, taxonomies, they can't they can't add more taxonomies actively now. Like there there's still the, being things done in their name, but they can't produce more of these right now. 
So you need a, a sort of, this, the vantage point is quite relevant from where you then like look at time, I guess. No? <laughs> not sure. No, not sure, okay. I think there's a question over there. Right. It's uh, not really a question, I guess, but a short reflection that kind of popped up in my mind when I when I heard you listen when I listened to what you were talking about, and I, I think the idea of starting with situations uh, in which which are paradoxical, in which somehow like the same is different. There were several examples that you had, for example, in the beginning, a situation in which you have several truth claims about one and the same situation, or about uh, the tree which had several respects, which, or which could be uh, seen in several respects. Rather, some of them are curing or help, helpful, and others are disastrous. And, and this whole idea, I think this is very interesting, of starting with a paradox in which you have a situation where the same is different, and then thinking of how you can unfold this paradox by introducing a distinction, for example, uh, in the time dimension that it has changed and therefore the same is different, or in, in, in the social dimension that you have diff different perspectives uh, of two observers and therefore the same is different, or that you have one and the same object which is seen in, uh, in different ways or in different respects, and therefore the same is different, and, and this whole idea of exploring paradoxical situations in which the same is different this is very appealing to me. Do we have a response to that? It, it was not a question. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, my question would then maybe be if, if you kind of uh, explored this systematically or if this just popped up in this discussion of if it's just me seeing this or because you, you were triggered so much by the thing, yeah, I love this paradox in the tree, and then I felt that you were kind of systematically exploring these things, I don't know. Yeah, I think that's an accurate ob observation. Um, yeah, I think once you start kind of um, to find your way in kind of different forms that can help you unpack or work with uh, contradiction, it's also endless. Um, so for us, it was very much it's in writing, it's in production, it's in uh, overlays, and it's, it's in the surface, it's in the medium, it's in the texture, it's in the time. Um, but it's also um, in the language itself. Um, and I think this is where we are currently, and the examples of the poetry are um, kind of example of that. Um, yeah, this is where we're currently, um, yeah, um, that's what we're currently, I think, most interested in, like right this moment. Um, and um, I think that also has to do, and this is a bit freewheeling what I'm doing here, but I really liked your observation, so I'm trying to kind of open something up. Like, I think for a long time we had been working a lot with sim like symbolism, symbolism, the like, uh, like iconography, and those are also forms of language, of course. You know, we're like we started as graphic designers, so there's like this. I keep having this huge affinity to the um, uh, the iconic and how and how icons and symbols kind of speak. Um, but once we had started uh, working on this idea of the contradiction in in language through these examples of Russian poetry, by first having been com gotten completely stuck on this idea of propaganda on the internet, um, which is from uh, another work. Um, I think we went through a phase of kind of completely deconstructing also what language means and then what symbolism or iconography kind of will mean. Um, so it feels like almost a kind of like deconstruction to kind of then be able to move forward again um, through more and more contradictions, if that makes sense. Thanks a lot for this. And I, I, was, I was thinking how for both of you, you actually try to transcend this image of static kind of graphic design and, and 
and find a new language by employing, actually moving image in a really specific way. Because one cannot say that what Meta Heaven is doing are kind of a cinematic experience, is this is film as an expand, like it's cinema, as an expanded thing, cinema by, it's cinema by other means. And also this kind of move, shift into GIF is also, be, uh, and how, how much is this connected to to maybe how I understand what you're saying, vantage point in Meta Heaven and this question of understanding, uh, with Luisa, which I kind of think is this question of the coloniality of our constantly understanding that subject formation, is, there is not one position for subject formation, but that actually then with these gifts, we are, one has to engage and understand how all these processes create multiple subjectivities. And, and so how did this move shift into, like I guess it's a question, also in the end formal question, how do we decide to kind of step out of the kind of a comfort zone of being a graphic design, like working with something that is static and is there and then you have to, and you move into like unknown territory in which you have to figure your way out as you go. It's funny because I was also trained as a graphic designer <laughs> and, and ended up with, uh, I don't know, I don't know what, how, how to describe what I'm doing right now. But uh, to me, I don't know, can I be very honest? When I started actually working as a graphic designer, all I wanted was to run to the hills because I found myself at some point just doing work for like banks and all this kind of stuff. And uh, I ran away to the hills of research and that's kind of how I ended up here. And you know, of course it, the, the graphic design training still shows up and is still very present, but yeah. I, 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 I ran away from it. Your turn. Okay. Um, thank you for this really strong, good question. I, I think that um, I wanted to say something that really sort of tries to tie in also with that previous question about political practice because I think that uh, when you are talking about uh, media literacy, for example, now, uh, something that we very strongly lack for the, the kind of media environment that we're in, uh, we need to look at strongly at the way that things are being made. So even when you talk about uh, like Twitter trolls or when you talk about uh, ways in which uh, political movements on the right uh, predominantly project majority or project hegemony, there's, there's, there's the way in which that gets reproduced within journalism is often a very low resolution picture of what's actually going on. And we're quite interested, I guess, in the way in which images that are quite maybe superficial or even gifts or that even seem quite meaningless are made and the psychology of their making. And that's a way in which uh, political, in which a political, uh, in which uh, politics become possible again, by not accepting the fact that there is a sort of majority, but seeing how this, the image or how the semblance of majority is created. Um, and in order to do that, we, we, it's not just enough to talk about troll farms and to talk about organized forms of labor because also propaganda is also flexible uh, precarious labor like all forms of labor so there is various ways in which we can sort of examine this the way in which uh, um, our f film work or cinema well, whatever like moving image work came into being was very much from the desire to work on projects for a much longer time so to not be to to this to to create maybe timelines of one year or one and a half year or two years going towards a result. Uh, and it was not only stepping out of a comfort zone because we're not the only people who do this. There's clearly, there's people at the same time after us and there's people before us who do this as well. So it's not a completely unique one-time event that this happens. Graphic design is also a very 
uh, has very permeable boundaries. It's not a, a, a really well-defined field in, to begin with. So to go beyond that field is not exactly as if you're going to, like traveling like with Virgin Galactic to the, to the outer. <laughs> like it is some, it, it depends on what you do with it. It's not, it's not that you do it, it depends on what you, what you want to do with it. Uh, that, that makes a difference, I guess. Um, and then there's the element of lyricality, uh, speaking about that what you feel strongly about, and not just pointing at things that you want, that you that you critique in a way. Um, thank you so much. I wanted to ask a question. Actually, it's something about the lyricality um, makes me want to ask a kind of offbeat question, which is thinking about the context of the film in the dome, and as you've mentioned several times, the multiple, multiple levels of truths competing for attention. I'm curious about the role of belief, and maybe even perhaps religion, if that plays any role in your thinking and how you construct your work. Um, I think I am not really ready to answer the question about religion, although it does feel like I'm sitting somewhere that resembles a church. Um, but belief, yeah, I think the... Um, you know, before we talked about like the way in which an audience, you know, can read a work, like have their own interpretation of it. At some point in our work, I think it was in 2015, we had this slogan up on our studio wall, in the future, conflicts will be one with belief alone. Um, and this is because it felt like anything that we came across that was an image could the next second be immediately used for the, something completely opposite of it. So we felt the only way in which movement would, or in the only way in which images would um, kind of move or how meaning or, um, not meaning's not the right word, how um, content would be moved around would be by the belief in it to be moved or in how it would be interpreted. Um, so this led us to also then to to kind of start digging into, you know, what is what is this truth? What are these truths? How is truth? What does a word even mean? Where can we find it? Um, and this is what led us to examples of, of Russian literature and poetry to to begin with. Um, I think there's there's another layer to it, if I may. Yeah. Uh, that, that that is the layer that uh, the speech act of uh, saying what you quote unquote belief, creates that belief. So the idea that this, there's a very interesting book called Banking on Words by Arjun Apadurai, which we very much recommend, which locates the uh, financial crisis of 2008 eventually in language. So he, he peels off the, the kind of like economic macro speak about these uh, credit swap uh, packages to the notion of the promise which he then relates to ritual practices, uh, going back to the work of um, people like Corpoliani, Marcel Mauss, etc., who studied gift practices, and that the gift implicitly, uh, the, that gift rituals contain the the, uh, the notion of the reciprocity uh, as a as a core component. And then he talks about the speech act of the promise as one that sort of creates the. It creates its own truth in a way. So when you talk about belief in a larger sense, you, you eventually come down also to the way in which um, language is this incredibly tricky and contradictory tool because certainly uh, people like uh, Bidensky and also Ostashevsky go much further than, uh, and there's nothing to say about Apadurai's incredible research, but they would not believe a promise to begin with. They would not believe any promise to begin with. They would actually be so skeptical about any positive statement. And this connects, in the work of Videnski, this connects to the notion of negative theology, meaning that we are approaching 
um, we're like we're approaching God through negative statements, through, through like negation, the negation of. So we cannot approach uh, this notion through positive, uh, through a positive approach, but only through a negative approach, which brings us back to these turnarounds, which do the same thing in kind of like playful verse, which is very joyful. So talking about belief as such or religion as such brings you, you know, always back to the way in which language encodes these things in, a, in an incredibly tricky way that, de that deceives us also. Uh, and that is not to say that there is any language that does not deceive us. It's just, yeah. So it's, it's, more, it's trickier than that. But I can Im very much imagine where the question is coming from looking at the, maybe the recent works from the last few years. Is it something that plays a role for you as well? Uh, questions around this, because you talk also about magic. Yeah. 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 I mean, of course, there's there's a, a deep spiritual connection when when you're talking about these plants. I mean, even like Rue uh, or Ahude, as we call it in Brazil, it's a, it's a plant for luck, and it's a plant that like you can use for blessings and this kind of thing. And uh, I don't know, to me, there's a different kind of spirituality that is involved in that. It's not in terms of organized religion, but in terms of uh, like these rituals and rituals of, again, you know, going back of care, of being together, of uh, caring for each other, of also healing, not as an individual practice, but as a community practice. And uh, I mean, to me, that's much more interesting than, than something around like some form of organized religion. Also because organized religion has historically actually persecuted these practices, right? So yeah, to me, that's, that's something that is deeply, deeply spiritual, but really in its own way. And there's so many different ways of, of um, practicing that spirituality. And to me, the dinner is also something like that. It is this, this form of like healing and care and, and yeah, this spiritual thing. Uh, also because the, the depending like the food that I, I try to cook in these dinners is food that has a history, is food that I grew up eating, is food that references uh, all of these uh, histories, all these histories that are personal, but they're also part of uh, a community, really. But one would, would say that the, the necessity to tell these stories is the precondition even for that, because if, yeah. if, if those, if, because there's something in the way that you feel the urge to, to do this and, and then do it, that um, communicates the urgency or that communicates the necessity. It's not just, oh, hey, like, here's some, like, I mean, I can also start sharing the food for my youth, but it won't mean this, it will absolutely not mean the same thing, if you know what I mean. Like, and I think the notion of spirituality, however, like uncapturable, how, how vague that is. I think that is a, a much more is a much more useful starting point, perhaps, than talking about religion, which implies organized church going and the institutions and that are repressive in all kinds of forms. Uh, and but I guess that the question was also not not necessarily about the, the church, quote unquote, or about organized religion. I'm not sure. Uh, I guess it had a wider meaning yeah. or opened up to. The, the, the notion of spirituality. Um, yeah, but it, right. I mean, in this space, like, I, I feel like we're in a pulpit or something. This whole, like, high ceilings, arches, whatever, yeah. Anything I feel else? like anyone else? For absence of a moderator, like, we're like, we? we're like 2140. Okay, yeah. Is that but maybe a moment to round up unless there's up. One, last, um, yeah. one last question or remark? There's not. Anyone? 
It's a wrap. It's yeah. a wrap then. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Louisa.